now I'd like to welcome our next speaker, who's John Shanks. Uh, John's joining us from the Northern Territory, the top end. Um, he's an um, a antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist uh, with a focus on OPAT and HITH, uh, working in tropics and regional settings, so the topic of temperature is very important. He's previously from the, been from the Blue Mountains area, uh, but now has been the Royal Darwin Hospital for the last eight years. Uh, he's got a background history in biotechnology, pharmacy, and also IT. Thanks very much. Thank you. Right, so, just following on from that talk, I would say probably none of our patients meet the 95% criteria, um, which, yeah, it's a shame, but um, you'll see why in a minute. So just to give a rundown of the health service, um, so we probably cover an area maybe one and a half times the size of Tasmania, um, and each of these little crosses is a health centre, and they might be managed by an Aboriginal health worker or by a nurse prescriber, or in some of the luckily, lucky ones, we might have a rural GP or a rural medical officer. Um, and it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, and for me, personally, in terms of AMS, this is my focus point, because um, the prescribing can be interesting in these communities. Um, and it's very easy to give a stat dose of keftriaxone, or maybe you know, three days of keftriaxone, just a single dose IM, send the patient out, they'll come back to the community's clinic, and they'll redose that way and get their own OPAT out in the community. Um, Supply is a real issue to these areas. So pretty much all these top areas during the wet season, that gets cut off by the rain. There's no road access. And the top guys, you know, we've got a barge which goes out every four days, and, but you can't put an infuser on a barge. <laughs> yeah. And so really, um, we're stuck, you know. Um, we can't get drugs out to these guys, so they've got to all come to us. Um, which is why we've built a very nice hospital in the home facility. Um, so it's around 75, 80 beds, uh, I can't remember. Um, well, and it just sits to the side of the hospital. And so all our community patients come to that and they stay in self-contained accommodation and they get their OPAT every day from the centre there, uh, which is a really great way to do it. It saves the health service a lot of money. We don't have to charter flights to get drugs out to them. Um, and it's a lot nicer for the patient they can get out of the hospital. Um, the hospital itself is just to the side, and it's around 400 beds. Um, also means you see some interesting things. You see people who have never used an elevator in their life, and that's always interesting. Um, well, the other day I was walking out of work, and there were some people cooking a magpie goose just outside the front door, and it was great. I just thought, you know, you don't see that in other places. It's really, it's really nice. It's really good. Um, so it's a really positive thing for the hospital to have such a developed hospital and home service. We also do home visits, um, but only to the greater Darwin region, so about a half an hour trip away, um, but no further. Um, we have challenges with microorganisms, um, so these are the, probably the big four. We get a bit of MDR, TB, or NTM, um, but Really, Acinetobacter bomini, um, that's a big one. We give all our pneumonia patients gentamicin to try and cover that and when they first come in. Um, Cryptococcus and Nicardia, I know you guys get that, but we tend to get maybe a little more, and we get it in patients who you wouldn't see it in otherwise. So not just HIV positive patients, but also in patients who've just got diabetes as a risk factor. Um, and the big guy is Burkholderia pseudomelia, which is meliodosis. Um, I'm sure there's something you've heard about. Um, we get roughly 90 cases a year. That varies, you know, a fair bit. But, you know, around the 90 case mark. Um, and that requires pretty prolonged IV treatment. Um, which is challenging because the temperature is not excellent in the top end. So this is um, just like a one-day test we did during the dry season. We just put a probe in inside the infuser, so next to the bag, and also in the bum bag as well, um, and sent it home um, with one of the guys, and you can see that pretty much the entire time it's above 25 degrees. Um, yeah, and just like at Royal Brisbane, it gets up to 40 at one point. Um, and 
I would hate to see what happens during the wet season, but it's, it's up there, you know, the temperature's never at that below 25 degree range, so I think we may not get that 95% confidence there. Um, and the reason for this is just, it's a hot place, <laughs> like, it's hot, it is. it's hot all year round. Um, the daytime temperature never goes below 30, never, ever, I've never seen it below 30. And um, you know, in the eight years I've lived in Darwin, it has never once dropped. Like the nighttime temperature once got to 14 degrees and everyone was rugged up, but that was absolutely like weird cold snap. Um, it's ne like it's usually about 25, 28 during the night. And um, so it's, n yeah, no wonder the infusions are sitting up so high. Couple this with patients from communities who hate air conditioning. They will refuse to sit inside. They will always be outside in the grass. They love it out there. Um, which, yeah, makes for some hot infusers. And um, so we need to do a risk versus benefit analysis really on whether we're gonna get a benefit or what is the risk of the patient leaving. Um, because if we do treat a patient with meliodosis, typically we need four to six weeks of IV treatment. Um, and at any one time, we've got one to 20 patients with melioid um, going through the HIF service. So that's a lot of treatment. And if you try to tell a patient who otherwise feels better that they need to stay in hospital for the next five weeks, you can, it's, it's hard to explain that. Um, yeah, so... So we had a lot of trouble, um, as other people have, with the great pyridine scandal of 2017. Um, and so we've, not by want, but by necessity, we've sort of had to do our own thing up there. We, we just do not have the capacity to keep 90 patients as inpatients for six weeks every year. Um, they don't have the mental health either for that. It's just not possible. And so we got the notification from Baxter that keftazidine was no longer stable at 25 degrees and that we'd need to give, I think it was four six hourly infusions or something like that. It was not possible. Um, and we certainly couldn't do a QID HIF service. Um, that's also not possible. Um, and so we had to sign off that form C to get Baxter infusers at our own risk on the same day, um, which was pretty, scary um, so we had a good look into it um, we had a look at the SDS for pyridine just to see what what is actually the issue with pyridine there's really very little known about the side effects of pyridine at the moment I don't think people get exposed to long-term pyridine um, that often um, except in the NT <laughs> um, and we had a good look at why why did Baxter actually make this recommendation um, I understand, you know, we get maybe 60 milligrams of pyridine per infuser. Um, I think it's a little less than that. Um, and there's really two main bodies which look at acceptable pyridine levels. So if you go by the EMA, the European agency, they allow two milligrams per day, um, which, you know, it's a hard and fast cutoff, two milligrams, any product. Um, whereas the USP allows 1.1 milligram per mil. So if you times that by a 240 mil infuser, you know, that's 259 mils or something, 259 milligrams of pyridine. That's a pretty big difference between two milligrams and 260 milligrams of pyridine being the acceptable cutoff. That's a big change there, so why is that? And um, once again, out of necessity, we went with the bigger one. <laughs> um, and we actually changed um, manufacturers as well. We left Baxter and we went to Slade, um, who still produce keftazidine infusers, do not require you to do a Form C, um, and they use the United States cutoff, which is actually 0.75% of the Baxter cutoff. Um, and I know like, we're, pick, we're picking and choosing which guideline we'll take, and this really highlights the fact that we need an, you know, an international sort of guideline to say this is the amount of pyridine that is safe and this is the amount that is you know produced in an infuser um, but really we've been doing this for you know decades um, and we haven't had any treatment failures um, and the alternative is 
a pretty nasty disease. So yeah, I think you know we are definitely taking some risks here, um, and we don't want to be taking these risks. But you've got to be a bit pragmatic with this, and just yeah, do what's best for the patient. I think. And um, so we're still take giving um, keftazidine. And we went off this French paper as well when we were coming up with our solution. And this was a really interesting patient uh, paper. And basically it says that if you give 12 hourly infuser changes, it'll, it's a bit safer. And that's just going to mitigate the risk. So what we do now is we give a 6 gram infuser, which goes over 24 hours. And, but we, change, we take the remaining infuser off and change it for a fresh one after 12 hours. That way if the patient goes AWOL, you know, we can't get them at that 12 hour mark, they're still hooked up to an infuser, they'll get the rest of their dose. Um, but if we can, we will mitigate that pyridine accumulation by getting rid of the, the already hot infuser and, you know, put a cold one on. Um, listen, that's the best we could come up with, so, yeah. Um, we've got a lot of challenges with infuser transport, as I said. So we need to get our orders in by 9.30 in the morning for an infuser to come in the next day, which, you know, can be tricky. Um, this will then take another day to get out to our regional hospitals in Gove and Catherine, um, or, you know, it could be more out to Gove, depends when the flight's going. Um, which just basically means anything with a shelf life of less than 72 hours we cannot use. Um, that's basically. Um, so meripenem and unbuffered cafoxetin off the cards, pretty much, for us. Um, we use probenicid a fair bit, um, as you can understand. It's hard to get infusers out to people, um, especially in discharges to community clinics. It's very hard to drug monitor, so I would absolutely love to know what our pyridine levels are in our infusers, or what our keftazidine levels are after 24 hours, but it's a bit difficult um, when we don't measure beta-lactam levels out there. Um, same with amikacin, azoles, and lenezolid levels. These take three to seven days to get back, usually from St. Vincent's or Royal Brisbane. We'll send the levels to one of these guys. Um, and it can take quite a while to get the level back. And um, then if we've got a patient in a regional hospital, that'll be an extra three to five days to get the levels back. So we're looking at a week or so, you know, if they're in a regional hospital to get the levels back, which makes it difficult especially when we have complicated patients. So this is a Nicardia patient we had. It was on long-term lenezolid and amikacin, um, and he was also a dialysis patient, and you know, not much evidence on how to dose amikacin in dialysis. Do you do it after dialysis? Do you do it before dialysis? We opted for the before dialysis for the first time, um, just to get the big peaks and you know, clear it out, but we had no idea. We were flying blind. Um, so. We got lucky um, that we changed the filter to a larger filter and he changed to a five hour session. Because this level we got, you know, you got to remember that took five to six days to come back later. And so we were really quite lucky to just see in the levels, oh, we were spot on. Yeah, it's tough. Um, yeah. So our real solution to monitoring is just to do regular UECs, LFTs, full blood count. And we do twice weekly review of hearing on patients on aminoglycosides. We do a thing called the Burroughs test, where we move the patient's head and make them read a Snellen chart. And if they can read it, then they're all good. And, and we do monthly formal audiometry. We have a lot of challenges with staff. And so we've got a rotating foot workforce. And people usually stay for a year, maybe two. Um, and this is really hard for me. In terms of AMS, um, keeping staff updated and you know, uh, learning about the different guidelines in the top end, that's really difficult. There's a group think mentality in the top end and I think maybe even worse than in other hospitals. I know everyone has a group think mentality at their workplace, um, but there's definitely a we are different to the southern states, so we don't need to follow guidelines mentality, which is hard to quash sometimes. Um, in some of the surgical and medical teams. But it can be a benefit as well. Um, if people think they're doing things different, they tend to do it more often. So our pneumonia guidelines followed pretty well, you know, and things, things where we do things a little different, it's followed to the letter. Um, so it can be a positive and a negative thing. The way we've gotten around this is we've 
start giving report cards to all our prescribers so once a year. Um, every antimicrobial script we get, we put into a database and everything we see gets put in there and we pull the consultant details from our EMED system. So there's no bias there when we're entering it. And that all just gets collated on automatically. Um, and then we give them, you know, a report card based on the NAPS grading system. Um, you know, one being very good, four being very bad, and just say, this is how many of each script you've got. This is how often your scripts are appropriate versus your division versus the rest of the hospital. And this is how often. Um, how do you monitor people who make the switches? How do you monitor people on high risk anti antimicrobials? 20 to 30 percent of our, our OPAT patients now are on complex orals. And it's amazing how many get QT changes, who get LFT dysfunctions, and how do you monitor those? Um, and how do you get the partnership with primary care and GPs to monitor those and, 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 and the infrastructure set up? And so costing it is, of course, there. But there is a growing evidence for IV to oral switching, whether it's burn and joint, whether it's endocarditis, whether it's um, intra-abdominal infections, a whole plethora up there within adults and paediatrics. Um, so we've got to be cognizant of it. Um, and I, I just put this up as a, this was shown to me by one of our colleagues in the UK. And if you look at, you know, Ertapenem has got two interactions listed. Okay, but actually if you use Cipro as a step down or alternative, you've got 36. If you use Ticoplanin, which you do in the UK, zero. And if you use a combination of Riff and Doxy, you know, you're, you're having to think outside the box slightly. There's more things that could go wrong. And I think people are used to thinking oral is better in terms of side effects. Um, but look at the Aviva study and start looking at the, the, the detail of when patients got adverse events. Um, uh, and similarly with, with Linezolid. So we are in new times of OPAT. Uh, the safety data is there. Um, we are expanding into new territories, such as acute medicine and ambulatory care, um, and telemedicine. And how do we make sure that the stewardship and governance and outcomes and safety netting of our patients are, are there? So all the infrastructure is there, but it's how do we model ourselves in a new era. Um, so patients have, individual patient management is, is important um, around reviewing um, everything that's on the screen, making sure that organisations have accountability and processes and IV to oral switch programs is, is, is important um, and making sure that your hospital supports you in what you're trying to do. Um, some, some people have suggested that actually anyone who's failed, I mean it'd be interesting to know actually, anyone who fails OPAT in your, or, or HIV in your organisation, how many of you do a root cause analysis as to why they failed? Put your hands in the air. <laughs> 